Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see you again. I was just last week I was here, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. If I was wrong, correct me. Let's turn in our Bibles now to the Old Testament, to Jonah chapter 1 and 2. I'm going to begin reading with verse 14, 17 and uh, through the entirety of chapter 2, verse 10. Let's hear now God's holy word, Jonah 1:17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and heard you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth and its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with voice of thanksgiving I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. In the reading of this passage, let's bow our heads together now and ask the Lord's blessing on this. Our Father, as we read this passage and see testimony of one who was really in a dark place, we ask that you would give to us understanding of ourselves and your work and intention for us. For we too go through dark places and have dark times. We ask, O oh Lord, that from the example of Jonah and the lesson of Jesus Christ, we may indeed find hope and light to see us through those dark times. We ask, O oh Lord, that indeed we may find you as we've never found you before in those dark places. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone had a small glass of water, I would really appreciate it. In Jonah 1.17, it says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Well, of course, we don't have to introduce Jonah to you. He's one of the best-known figures in the Bible. But we also probably also know that liberal scholars and skeptics say that the story of Jonah and the whale was myth. Uh, it was not for scholars, but for children, not for serious thinkers. I heard the story about, about a little girl in an elementary school studying about the ocean. And then the teacher told the class, I don't want any of you to be afraid of going into the sea because there is no sea creatures that can swallow you whole. Well, <coughs> this little girl, she raised her hand and she said, I learned in church that a great fish swallowed Jonah whole. And the teacher scoffed at that and said, that's impossible, that could never happen. The little girl said, when I go to heaven, I'll ask Jonah myself and find out if it's true. <laughs> to which the teacher replied, what if Jonah didn't go to heaven? The little girl thought and then answered, well, then you ask him. <laughs> <laughs> well, in chapter 2 of the book of Jonah, we find the prophet in the belly of the great fish. And that God himself had prepared that fish specially for the purpose of swallowing Jonah whole. And there's a lesson in that for every Christian. 
You see, Jonah was fleeing from God because God told him to go to Nineveh and preach a warning message of repentance to them. Jonah didn't want them repenting, these idolatrous people. And so instead of following God's command, he turned and he left. He went to a far off place or aimed for going to a far off place in Tarshish. So he boarded a boat for that purpose. But the Lord set a storm. The sailors found out that it was Jonah's count that a storm was sent by God. So they actually agreed and Jonah was willing to throw him overboard so that perhaps that would satisfy the anger of God. And it did. But as soon as Jonah hit the water, there was a fish there ready to swallow him whole. And he did. And only then did Jonah find himself in the deep darkness of a monstrous fish's stomach. Only then did he call upon the Lord. That prayer is recorded in the second chapter of Jonah. And in that passage, we learn something of what it is to pray in the dark. Do you know what it is to pray in the dark? It is the Christian who falls away and has lost his assurance of salvation. It is the soul that has turned his heart away from God because of guilt and bitterness. It is the soul that's fallen into spiritual depression. It is the person that can pray the prayer that you prayed this morning from the depths of his heart. Innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me. I'm not able to look up. There are more than the number of hairs on my head. My heart fails me. Yeah. This is the kind of darkness that makes prayers like that seem futile because the person is so deeply embedded in that Stygian blackness. But God uses darkness. God uses the darkness to awaken us. He uses the darkness to, to move us to turn to him. He uses the darkness so we will pray. So there are three questions that come out of this question, out of this chapter. They are, what has brought on this darkness for Jonah? The second question is, what is God doing in the darkness? And the third is, is there hope for you when you pray in this dark state? First question. We really need to know and understand what really brought on this darkness. Jonah brought it on, of course, by his own disobedience. That's the easy answer. But let's take a look at a little more detail. You see, from the time that God commissioned Jonah to go to Nineveh, there is no mention of his praying. Jonah rejected the Lord's call, and so he didn't turn to talk with God, much less did he want to hear from God. He wanted to get away from God. So it says in chapter 1, verse 3, he escaped out, out, out away from the presence of the Lord. And that's where I thought he was doing. What was going on in Jonah's heart? He was a prophet, after all, a prophet of Israel. Well, the same things can happen to other prophets or a king, as it did with David. There's King David, who knew from personal experience, he explains in Psalm 32, 1, 3, and 4, when I kept silent, that is about his sin, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. What did this? It was guilt. It's guilt. It's all about, blessed is the man who, on whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. David was silent about his iniquity. He held on to his guilt, guilt for that adulterous affair he had with Bathsheba and the sins that accompanied him. So he couldn't face it. Because he couldn't face it, he refused to deal with God. And then there's Asaph, Psalm 73. He knew bitterness as he expresses it in verses 3 and 21 to 23 of Psalm 73. He said, For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. When my soul was embittered within me, 
when I was pricked in my heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. And how might Jonah have been compared to these men? Well, like Asaph, Jonah was bitter against Nineveh. He was jealous. He was commissioned to preach repentance and give them an opportunity to escape judgment. He didn't want it. And that scene comes up again in the next chapter. Then like David, he was evading God because he wanted to cover his guilt, his disobedience against God. And so it took an act of grace on God's part for both of these men to, to reach out to them. And he is doing the same with Jonah, an act of grace, God going after these men who are in a dark state because of bitterness, because of resentment or disobedience. And how far did God go to get their attention? He simply sent a prophet, Nathan, to David. He worked somehow in Asaph's heart so that he could see more clearly that he was holding him by the hand all the while. He had been bitter. But what about Jonah? To what extent would God go? And the answer is, as far as it takes. That's the extent to which God will go to retrieve his people. As Jesus, the good shepherd, will go after the sheep, even leaving the 99. We'll look at what job God put Jonah through to get his attention. Jonah describes his experience in the belly of the fish. He helplessly is entangled in a den of, of half-digested garbage. Weeds were wrapped around my head. He was entangled in it. He felt like he had gone to hell. He says, in the, in the belly of Sheol, verse 2. He, he, he felt like he was buried alive in the digestive system of a monstrous fish. Like he was behind the prison doors of death. He said, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. There's no escape. He felt like he was dying. It was inevitable. Verse 7. My life was fainting away. But worst of all, Jonah felt like he was separated from God. Ironic, huh? He fled away from the presence of the Lord in order to get away from his commission. Now he was most terrified by being separated from God. Verse 4. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. What, did, what this did was awaken Jonah from his lethargy to the reality of the state of his heart. The reality didn't break through Jonah at first. You remember when he was in the ship, even during the storm at sea, he was asleep down below. It was when it really seemed to be dangerous that he came up. And all the while he refused to pray. But it was only when the wind beat upon the sails and the sea churned and the waves thrashed against the sides that he recognized the consequences of his brash behavior. And with all the options were closed, his heart responded with a confession of sin and confessed to his sailors why the storm had come and offered to allow them throw, to throw him overboard. Suddenly Jonah becomes like a new man. Sometimes the very best thing that can happen to us is the very thing that we most dread. But it's the thing that we most dread that has its greatest impact on our hearts. And so he was cast away only to be consumed by a monster from the deep. And now he discovers how his bitterness and guilt brought him into this terrible darkness. Listen to the desperation he expresses, verse 2. I cried out for help. Verse 4. I said, I am banished. That's utter hopelessness. And he said, my life was fading away. As it was fading away, I remembered the Lord. Verse 7. When he got to that point, it was then when Jonah had exhausted all hope that God moved in. So this is what brought on his darkness. It was his disobedience, his flight from God. What brought on his darkness also was God was determined to do whatever was necessary to recall his servant. 
Next question then is, what is God doing in the darkness? What was God doing with Jonah after all? You know, in a word, although Jonah was not aware of what was going on, and I certainly understand that, but believe it or not, listen, God was burying the prophet with Jesus Christ in order that he may raise him to newness of life in Christ. Ooh, that's, that's a concept that's hard to take in. Well, let's take, this, take a look at it piece by piece. Did you hear what I said? He was being buried with Jesus Christ in order that he may be raised to newness of life with Christ. Now, dealing with the matter of, of the fish itself. Generally, when you hear the story of Jonah, the idea is God was punishing Jonah because he fled from the presence and he punished him by having him swallowed by a fish. But no, that wasn't the idea at all. God was working with Jonah. The purpose for the fish, well, there were actually three purposes why God had prepared this fish. First, it was, became a protective haven from the sea to keep Jonah from drowning, okay? Obviously, because of the terrible storm that had taken place, and he had to be cast overboard before God's anger would be appeased because there was no escaping. But, what about Jonah? He would drown. The fish prevented that. Second reason for the fish, a personal transport. God hadn't withdrawn his commission, so he had that fish take him all the way back to the coastline of the Mediterranean Sea and spew him out on the beach. And he had to resume his journey to Nineveh, where we left him before. And the third reason for the fish, and this is the most important perhaps, a private sanctuary. Yeah inside the constrictive belly of that fish trying to digest him, yet he found a private sanctuary with the Lord where he could pray and come to recognize eventually salvation belongs to the Lord. Now Jesus explained what God was doing with Jonah in the darkness. In a word, he was giving us a sign, a sign of his own death and burial. Matthew 12, 40, Jesus said, he said, for as long as, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. <coughs> the sign God was displaying was how salvation is provided. It is provided by identification with Christ in his burial and after that in his resurrection. And so the Apostle Paul applies it to Christians. And he writes to us all, he says in Romans 6, 4, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, that is his death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. That is what God was doing with Jonah. And that is how Jonah was a sign of Christ. And that's where Jonah touches us. So let's take a look at this in in its pieces. Let's line up these ducks in a row. In particular, we see the symbolism of death and the symbolism of uh, the fish and so on. The symbolism of death is being cast into the sea. When we think about Noah's flood that destroyed all mankind, the water represented death. When Moses crossed the Red Sea, all of Pharaoh's army was destroyed. The river Jordan means death. So the, in order for Israel to pass from the old way of the wilderness into the new promised land, they had to pass through death. And the Lord parted the waters. But the water is the idea of death. And so we realize is that the sea symbolizes the power of death to swallow and destroy. And likewise, what about the fish? Well, the fish symbolizes the utter consumption of death that engulfs the sinner. One commentator was, was quite striking in his description. He said of this being swallowed by the fish, he said, quote, it is damnation. The fish is in fact hell. Jonah has thus traversed the agony and death and come to this hell prepared by God to enforce the total separation of man and God. Hell is 
the end of every desire to flee from God. Close quote. Moreover, the statement that Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, what's the point there? It speaks of death's finality. Jesus waited four days before he raised Lazarus in order that it might confirm that Lazarus was truly dead. He had already begun to decay. As for Jesus himself, though, he lay in the tomb three days in part to confirm that he was truly dead. That's the point of the three days and three nights. And the result of Jonah's death and burial was that the wrath of God has appe was appeased by this. And the troubled sea was calmed. And even the sailors could rejoice and sacrifice. But beyond that, we see then Jonah's resurrection. God, having been appeased by his death in Christ, also rose and raised him up in Christ. And that's when the fish expelled him onto the shore. And he rose up alive to God and ready to resume a life of obedience. He walked to Nineveh. Therefore, we see in Jonah the sign of Jesus' atoning death and resurrection prefigured in every way. As Jonah, our Lord suffered the pangs of death, but more, even enduring damnation because he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And as Jonah, Jesus on the cross appeared in every way to be utterly consumed by death. And that's why the soldier thrust him, his, uh, his javelin, into the heart of Jesus. Because he knew he was dead and he didn't have to break his legs. And it was appeared, he breathed his last. And then when the grave swallowed up Jesus and held him for three days, it appeared to all who witnessed it that it, this was his final entombment, his final place. But, like Jonah, Jesus' death appeased the wrath of God. Jesus' death brought peace on the stormy sea of a sinner's troubled heart. Just as Jonah's death in the deep calmed the sea, so Jesus' cross removed the wrath of God from our sins so that we may enter a new life, a life that conforms to Jesus Christ. You get it? What for Jonah was a sign for us is a reality. A reality of what God is doing in the darkness. The darkness of burial with Christ. We see him work in the darkness in so many saints. We see him in our life, but if you go through the Old Testament, back to King David again, where God indeed worked in his life and he found peace and blessing and joy. And Asaph, who discovered that God all the while was holding him by his hand when he thought he was discarded by God. Or Elijah, who wanted to die. Or the apostle Peter, who denied Christ three times. And Jesus encountered him and made him confess him three times after the resurrection. In each soul, God worked while it was dark. And he's working in your darkness as well. And every Christian has those periods of darkness. Every Christian. Every Christian who is suddenly stricken and caught in his sin. Suddenly eyes awakened up to the depth of his guilt. Every Christian who feels as though because of poor choices, God is punishing him. Every Christian who feels as the Lord has turned his face far from him. We all know what these dark spells are, the spiritual depression. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a book about it. The question is, is there hope for you when you pray in the dark? From what we've seen with Jonah, certainly we must say, yes, there's hope. But there's a reason why there's hope besides what we have just seen. There's another factor to your darkness that Jonah did not overlook. And he resolves and says in verse 4, Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. 
about having recognized that in his terrible plight that he wasn't dead, he must have recognized that God hadn't deserted him. Somehow then, he, when he re recognized that, he knew then that he could cry out to God even though he was crying from Sheol. He called out to the Lord from the belly of Sheol, but where did he cry to? It says in verse 4, Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. Where was the holy temple? But Jerusalem. What you don't yet understand is that God was not way off in Jerusalem. He understood that God could hear him from Jerusalem, but he didn't quite understand yet where God was. Jerusalem or the highest heavens. But did he understand that when he cried out that God was with him all along? While he was convinced by Jerusalem and by heaven, in fact, the temple was right there. The temple was in the fish's belly with Jonah, somewhere out there in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. For Jesus Christ is the temple, and he was buried with Christ. Christ says in John 2, 19, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up again. And in verse 21, it explains talking about his body. And that's the body that was, he was buried in. And there he dwells with Jonah, buried in the fish with Jonah. The temple buried with him and with the fish. Therefore, there is hope. He's not alone. Now, we are all encouraged in Hebrews 4.16 that we may look to the holy heavenly temple with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. But, friends... More than that, as Jonah assures us, God is with us even in the darkest recesses of hell. And we need to know that when we're suffering and when we've lost our way and when we just plain can't see. But David said it. David said it in Psalm 139, 8. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. And in verse 12, if I say, surely the darkness will cover me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide me from you. Indeed, even the Stygian blackness of our deepest depression may be a holy sanctuary in which we may offer our most sincere and honest prayers. And we may go into that prayer closet see nothing in there but darkness, be all by ourselves, and think we are utterly destitute, utterly alone, forsaken by God and by man, with no hope, not even knowing how to pray. The only thing you know that will never be taken away, and that is the presence of Jesus Christ there in the closet with you. So what did Jonah learn from his experience in the fish's belly? What might we learn? What we learn from Jonah should give us hope. There should be three grounds that we should find hope. The first is understanding. Jonah's real prison was not really the fish. It wasn't the depths of the Mediterranean Sea. Jonah's real prison was the unbelief and resentment he held toward God. And he was holding it within. That is the real darkness that was suffocating and strangling his own soul. And so it is for us. When we feel like we're cast away, and we are imprisoned by our circumstances, like we are separated from God, like we are dying within. Oh, that's, that's the real prison. Our hope is that we can confess it like Jonah did. We can bring it out and not hide it within and squirm and dream about it at night. Bring it out into the light to display it before God, like Hezekiah did when he saw the Assyrian army gathering around. He went into the temple and just, and just spread himself before God. This is all I have. What can I do? God only needs to hear that. And he will cleanse us from guilt, bitter unbelief, 
the stranglehold they have on us will be snapped. The second thing that we have gives us hope is that Jonah therefore came to realize that God, God sent him deep into the darkness, into the great fish, not to destroy him, but to save him. Remember that. Our deep darkness, we think he is ruining us. We think that he is beating us beyond what we can bear and we cannot go on. He's not destroying us. He's going to whatever lengths he has to to get our attention. But he's not destroying us. He's saving us. That's God. He's in the business of saving us. Nobody like God knows the utter horrors of evil that would lay their clutches on us if he didn't hold us in his hand. So let us understand he's there to save us even in our sorrows. Third, that gives us hope. We must never forget that in these dark nights of the soul, the Lord is with us. He hears your groans and he listens to your cries. As one who himself groaned and cried out from the cross on that dark, dark afternoon in which the sun was obscured and then he was buried in the darkness of the tomb. He is with us in our tomb. So we are buried with him who is the temple and we may worship him and find comfort in his presence even when we can't see knowing that as he rose, we shall rise too, because he is with us. In my studies, I read of an unusual tribal custom of a particular tribe of the American Indians. Its design was to prepare young braves who are emerging into adulthood. So on the night of his 13th birthday, this young brave was placed in a dense forest to spend the entire night alone in the darkness. Until then, he had never been away from the security of his family and tribe. But on this night, he was blindfolded and taken miles away. Then he took off the blindfold, and he was in the middle of thick woods by himself all night long in the darkness. And every time a twig snapped, he visualized a wild animal to pounce. And every time an animal howled, he imagined a wolf leaping out of the darkness on him. He thought surely he was going to die in the heart of this dark wood. After what seemed like an eternity, the first rays of sun began to emerge. And he saw flowers and trees in the outline of a pathway. And then... To his utter astonishment, in the morning, he turned and he saw a figure of a man standing just a few feet away, armed with a bow and arrow. It was the boy's father. He had been there all night long. Some of you here this morning, as I had said, may be tempted to give up on yourselves. You may have decided that after the Choices that you've made have regretted. God has turned his face away from you. But God never gives up on his people. God earnestly waits for you to cry out to him from whatever darkness you may be enduring, like Jonah. Only let us not repress our guilt and bitterness. Let us not run away from God or avoid him, nor fail to call out to the Lord with an honest and true heart. He can forgive you again and again and again and again. His mercies are limitless. And he will take you out of the darkness and give you a fresh start, a start you long for on the shores of a new life before you, not alone, but with a risen Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, 
Open our hearts, we pray, to see the closeness of Christ with us. Help us to recognize, indeed, what a horrible thing it is when we find that we're suffering the consequences of our decisions and think there is no hope. But Lord, I pray not only that your spirit would give us consolation in Jesus Christ, that we might know that we're never alone, but I also pray, Lord, that we may keep an eye out for one another and recognize those who are suffering, those who are in suffering the dark night of the soul. I ask, Lord, that you would grant to us a, a willing heart to offer comfort, counsel, prayers, in any way to support one another during these dark days. For we all go through them. Now, O oh Lord, we pray, lift us out as new men and women. I ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen.